Shem Hashem, Nehaseh V'Natsiyach. Welcome everyone as we are preparing for Shabbat, Parashat Miketz, Shabbat Hanukkah, and again Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, Be'ezat Hashem. Uh, we know we're going to take out three Sefer Torot on Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh Tevet, which is, is just Shabbat. We'll also take out three Sefer Torot, we all know on Simchat Torah, as well as on Shabbat Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So it's a very special holiday, special special times. When we take out three Sefer Torah, we know, I mean, when I was thinking about it, what's the, what's the significance of taking out three Sefer Torah, right? In fact, um, if you take out the Siddur, the Sha'are Tzion Siddur, they actually have in there a special tefillah based on Yeshiva Beit El over there in the Kabbalistic Yeshiva that they would say a special tefillah when they would take out three Sefer Torah. Like the special, it's a special Zman, Eit Ratzon, when three Sefer Torah come out. And like uh, Yosef always says, oh, why don't you read it from the Shari Tzion, the, the, the special tefillah for taking out the three Sefer Torot. I said, I don't know, the Minhag in different places have different stuff. What do you but do my father does it, that's right. But, um, but I was thinking, what's, what's, what's so special about it? And uh, I, I, I'm sure there are many ideas, many explanations, but something that I was thinking about was that we know that when we're praying, we're talking to Hashem, right? And when we're learning Torah, it's Hashem talking to us. And on Shabbat, Hanukkah, Verosh Chodesh, three Sefer Torah, I mean, Hashem talking to us three times, like times three. It's a very, very special occasion that I think Hanukkah also know the, the Nerot is a, it's a, it's a, um, a symbol to, to Torah Shabbal Peh, right? The, 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 the oral Torah, the Gemara, the Mishnah, and the, it's a special time period that a person who wants to come closer and understand Torah, this time is Et Ratzon for a person to come and to be uh, cling to Hashem and cling to the Torah. So let's take a look, as we know, that Parashat Miketz is the parasha that's always read on Hanukkah. Even when, a couple of years ago, you remember they had a Thanksgiving, which was when Thanksgiving and Hanukkah fell on the same time. And the expert said that Thanksgiving and Hanukkah will not fall for another 77,000 years, and that won't happen on the same time. Whatever the story is, Parashat Miketz is always read on Hanukkah. So if, the, if Chazal, Chachamim put in place that Parashat Miketz falls on Hanukkah, there must be some correlation, some, some sort of significance, some sort of understanding that Hanukkah and Parashat Miketz share. What happens in Parashat Miketz? For a minute, let's just take a look at what's happening in Parashat Miketz. We know that Paro is having this dream. And he has no one to interpret the dream. He has seven cows, another seven cows, seven skinny cows, seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, seven skinny cows, eat the seven fat cows, remain skinny. And he has no one to interpret it. Finally, they say there's this guy, he's a Ivri, a Nar, an Evid, he's a servant, he's a Jew, he's a young boy, he's in the prison. Maybe he can interpret it to you. All of a sudden, Yosef Atalik, who's in the prison all these years, is rushed out. He not only interprets, he gives advice. And he's made viceroy, he's made the second in command in Egypt. Now, if you would have taken anybody that day and say, do you think Joseph, the dreamer, is going to become king? That same day that he became king, no, no one in the right mind would say, I, yeah, he would become that. You know, our perception of the matter, the way we would have looked at it, it never would have happened. Another incident in this week's parashah, Yaakov has his ten sons go down to Mitzrayim, right? Now, Yaakov was a famous person, everybody knew him. Everyone knew the family of Abraham. They were considered a significant, important people. Yaakov's family heard about Yosef HaTzadik, Viceroy, the <coughs> Tzafnat Paneach in Mitzrayim. He saved all of mankind, all of the civilized world. They expect to come down and meet a rational ruler, somebody who's nice, somebody who's good, somebody who's not. All of a sudden, these 10 famous boys come down to Mitzrayim. They're charged with espionage. They're all spies. Uh, the Tzafnat Paneach is accusing them of all sorts of Weird accusations. And the brothers couldn't believe what's going on to them. All of a sudden, instead of getting the reception they thought significant people like them should get, everything's happening backwards. Again, something, if, if you would have taken a look when those 10 brothers were going down to Mitzrayim, you would not have thought they would have been charged on espionage and such things to happen to them. And yet, that happened. And that's pretty much a lot of the parashat miketas when something we would not think happened, happens. Rav uh, Ephraim Strum shared this story, and I think this story kind of uh, 
gets to the point of what Parshat Miketz is and what Hanukkah is and why Hanukkah is, always falls on Parshat Miketz. Um, I might get a little bit uh, into the story a little bit too much, but you'll forgive me. <laughs> Sam, an elderly gentleman, was very upset. He was having a hard time and he was walking on the streets outside on a very hot day and he, he spotted a building that had a big sign and the building said, join our healing session. Sam was tired, he was upset, he was hot. So he walked into the building where they had this healing session going on. And he sat down and he started to relax in the air conditioning room. Meanwhile, up on stage, the preacher was fired up. And the preacher said, who's not feeling well today? Come join me on stage. And so the woman walks up the stage, her name is Mary. And he says, Mary, what seems to be the problem? And Mary says, I can't move my arm. My arm doesn't move. The preacher turns to the crowd and tells everybody, let's all pray for Mary. And in unison, they all start to sing and dance and pray. Lord Almighty, heal Mary's arm. Lord Almighty, heal Mary's arm. And they're clapping and singing and swaying. Lord Almighty, heal Mary's arm. Lord Almighty, heal Mary's arm. And suddenly the preacher lifted his hand, turned to Mary and says, how is your arm? And miraculously she starts to lift her arm. And she says, I can move it. Praise the Lord. And everyone started to cheer. The preacher looks around. He says, who else has a problem? And Paul, Paul gets up. He says, what's the problem? He says, my leg. Paul limps his way up to the stage. He says, my leg for years, I can't move it. Again, the preacher looks at the crowd. And he tells everybody, let's pray together. And they all start screaming, Lord Almighty, heal Paul's leg. Lord Almighty, heal Paul's leg. And they clap, sing, dance, jumping up and down, doing all the motions. And suddenly the preacher lifts his hands and turns to Paul and says, how is your leg? And Paul says, great, I can move. And he starts to bounce off the stage like a trained sprinter. It's miracles. The preacher then sees Sam sitting at the act of the room. And he tells him, what's your name? He says, my name is Sam. He says, come up here, come up here, Sam. We're going to fix your problem. What's your problem? He says, it's my hearing. It's my hearing. I'm worried about my hearing. And the preacher looks at the crowd and says, his hearing. Let's pray for Sam's hearing. Lord Almighty, help Sam with his hearing. Lord Almighty, help Sam with his hearing. And again, they're clapping, they're singing, they're dancing up and down. And he turns to Sam, he puts his hand on him and says, how is your hearing? And Sam turns to the preacher and says, I don't know. My court hearing is in two weeks from now. So you see, sometimes we perceive something being one way, but really it's something entirely else. Right? This preacher thought you're talking about his hearing. He's talking about his court hearing. In life, a lot of times we look at the world through the way the um, media sets it up for us, right? The news puts out this and this information. We consume that and we make our opinions based on that. If you would take your news opinions and look at Yosef al-Sadiq, there's no way he should come out of the, of the dungeon and come to become the viceroy of Mitzrayim. If you think that Yaakov's 10 sons, prestigious people, the whole world knows about them. There's no reason why anyone will believe they're spies. But yet, we know that in this world, it's not the anchorman, it's not the news people. There's just one. There's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're going to read in the Haftarah on, 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 um, on Shabbat Hanukkah. The Haftarah we're going to read is from Zechariah. And there's a pasuk there that sums up everything we just talked about and sums up why my, my kids and Hanukkah is together. The pasuk in the, from the Haftarah says as follows in Zechariah. Hashem el Zerubavel. This is the word of Hashem to Zerubavel. Lamor, saying to him, Lo v'chayil v'lo v'choach. Not through armies and not through might. Ki im biruhi amar Hashem tzavakot. Hashem says, rather, through my spirit. It doesn't happen through strength. It doesn't happen through armies. It happens through one thing. Hashem wills it, 
And that's when it happens. If you would have paid attention to the news reports that were coming out of Jerusalem, coming out of Israel, at the times of the Hanukkah, no one would have thought that these Maccabees would win. And you know what? And even when they started winning, we would say, you know what? Oh, you know why they're winning? Because they had guerrilla warfare. They were jumping out and doing things like this. Oh, the guerrilla warfare tactics were working. No one would ever think that it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But that's exactly what it is. It's lo v'chovach v'lo v'chayel. It's not armies. It's not strength. It's ki'im beruchi. It's rather with Hashem's spirit. Hashem decides. Yosef is going to come out of the bar. Hashem decides. The brothers are going to get into problems. Hashem decides. The Jews are going to win. This is what the, 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 the Haftarah is teaching us. It's unfortunate, and uh, I, I remember when I was growing up, I don't know if it's still today, in Israel they have a team, like a sports team called the Maccabees, right? And they have these big garakos, these strong people there. And you look through the legends, you look through a lot of the coloring books, when they talk about the Hashmanoyim, they make them big, like strong people. The truth is, it's not that. If you look through the Alanis and that we read, we read that they were weak. Hashem, you put the mighty in the hands of the weak, you put the many in the hands of the few. You know, it was Yeshiva guys. The guys were sitting in Kohol in the, in the, in the Bay of the Bay All of a sudden, they went to war. And Hashem helped them. Because the truth is, Hashem decides what happens. Rav Palm says a little bit further here. And he says that there's a mitzvah. The mitzvah of Hanukkah requires a nir, A candle. And not a torch. There's a reason for that. Why? We know that me'at min ha'or doche harbe min ha'choshech. We know that a little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. The whole miracle of Hanukkah is not that we got up and we did something. It's that we got up and we did a little bit. Just a little bit. And then Hashem took over and did everything else. Rav Palm says that we have to think about accomplishments also in that way. You know, people think, oh, I'm not going to start doing something because I can't do it. It's too much. It's too big. It's too this. It's too that. I promise to start with a little bit. Just like the Hashem There's no way for them to win the war. There's no way. But they did a little bit. You light the candle, and well, Hashem makes, takes care of the rest. It's a very big Indian to learn from Hanukkah is that a person should take on himself just to do a little bit. And a little bit would lead to a lot. In the same way, you have to be very careful the opposite way. If a person has to starts to become a little bit less religious, a little bit, we're not going to keep certain things. You know, I heard recently people saying that, oh, maybe taking an Uber on Shabbat is not a problem because you're not driving, you order it before Shabbat, I, where, where, where such, such ideas come That's from. Yeah, order it the Uber before Shabbat, schedule for Shabbat, and then let it take you somewhere else. The first time I've ever heard of such a thing. And, and, and it starts a little bit, and then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, this person's going to be Shalom, doing something, something much, much, much worse. It's, and that's not allowed either, 100%. That's not allowed. But people will rationalize a small little breach. Now, if you have a solid brick wall, and it becomes a little hole, if you don't take care of that hole, eventually the hole, the whole the place can, and can fall down. It's called, one of the things is called the broken glass theory. If you have a building and someone breaks one glass window and you don't take care of that glass window, that's it. Everyone knows you can start breaking it, coming in and doing whatever you want. A small little something can go a big way in both ways. And that's what, and that's what Hanukkah, or Parshat Miketz, is coming to teach us. So let's move on to another lesson that is about Parashat Miketz and about Hanukkah. Yosef Atzalik is pulled out of the bar. He's brought to Paro. And Paro says, explain the dream. And he explains it beautifully after so many different people tried to explain it and it didn't come out well at all. Yosef Atzalik explains it. And then Yosef Atzalik tells him, He says, now go and find a chacham, a smart person, and put him in charge of Eretz Mitzrayim. In order to collect the, the wheat and collect the food for the seven years that were plenty. A lot of Mepharshim ask, one second. Paro asked you, Yosef, to interpret. He didn't ask you to give unsolicited advice. 
you know, Paro is the ruler of Mitzrayim. He can have anybody's head off like that. You don't just start going ahead and start telling your ideas. Let me pitch you an idea. Find someone smart and wise and losing. Paro didn't ask for that. So why is Yosef HaTzadik telling him this advice? So some explain that in the dream itself, it was showing that you had to do that. But Pam says there could be another reason. Yosef HaTzadik understood that if something was not going to happen right now, the seven years will come and the seven years will go. The seven years of plenty will come and go. And everything that they worked for, everything they could have collected, would have been for nothing. Because nobody would pay attention. Because when you have a lot of stuff, when it's going good, when the good is going right now, you're not thinking about the future. Right? Right now I have tons of food. What am I worried about? I'm not worried about anything. Then all of a sudden, when it's starting to get a little less, then people are starting to get worried. Yosef said you need to have a chacham. A chacham his haro'et hanolad. He looks at what's going to be in the future. Already now, he's planning for the future. Right? Um, you have to learn how to plan. Rav Pam says, one big thing is young people. We're all considered young people. We look and we say, we still have 60, 70, 80 years. We're good. We have plenty of time. Especially youngsters in yeshiva. I have plenty of time. We're good. We have time. We don't have to worry about these things right now. The story is, if you don't take advantage in the years of plenty, Baruch Hashem, we still have our health. We still have, we're still moving, walking, doing. If we're not taking advantage in the years of plenty, what's going to be when it's not years of plenty anymore? When it comes to years of famine, that's your shalom. A person has to look at this time. As the Gemara tells us, the person doesn't prepare an Erev Shabbat, what he's going to have to eat on Shabbat? You have to do now. A person has to pay attention to what he's doing right now. Because now is the time for later. You have to prepare now. There's a classic story with the Stipler Gaon. The Stipler Gaon was a student in another dark yeshiva. And he visited home for a Shabbat right before the outbreak of World War I. He was applying to return to yeshiva. And the father of one of his friends in the same yeshiva asked him to take a letter back to his son. The Stipler said, for sure, I'll take the letter. And the Stipler left with the letter in his pocket. But he never got back to yeshiva. In the middle, by the time traveling to yeshiva, World War I broke out, and the stipler was stuck somewhere between his hometown and yeshiva with nowhere to go. He couldn't get, all the borders were closed. He kept this letter sealed in his pocket for eight years. Finally, after eight years, the stipler met the student who he's supposed to deliver the letter. The stipler didn't know that this boy, his friend, his father, was killed during the war. And the stipler gave the letter to this, to this young man, and the man was so, he was, like, he was moving to tears, because you know, he's getting a letter after his father was killed already. He found that his father was killed, and now he's getting a letter from before his father was still alive. And he takes that letter, and he starts reading it, and he says, he's reading it out loud, and his father wrote to him, my dear son, how are you? How is your learning? I hope you're doing well in yeshiva. I'm writing to ask a favor for you. When you come back home, can you please bring along a few salty herring fish? As you know, in our town, they're very hard to come by and quite expensive. Thank you. With utmost love, your father. Don't forget the herring. This is what he had from his father after his father passed away, after the whole war happened. Now, there's nothing wrong with his father wrote, but what was left over was a letter about salty fish. We have to pay attention because what are we leaving over after we move on. Rav Isaac Sher, on the other hand, he would say, he had a person in the yeshiva um, that he used to get a letter from his father and would write every time, my dear son, every time you're learning, every time you're learning something in the Torah, think how you would learn if this would be your last day of your life. And the letter was signed, Nosan Tzvi, he was the Alter Mislavotka, Rav Nosan Tzvi Finkel, and it was written to his son, Rav Eliezer Yehuda Finkel, who became the founder and Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael. It's how you look at life right now. Are you looking at life right now as you're preparing for the future? 
or are you looking for life right now? And this is what Yosef HaTzadik was teaching. Yosef HaTzadik was telling Paro, right now it's going to be a lot. If you don't pay attention, you don't be smart, you're going to lose out on everything. Um, how bitter will a person's regret be, Rakpam says, when he comes to Olam Haba and he realizes how many diamonds he lets slip through his fingers. The Chafetz Chaim was a practical person and he made a study and noted that on average a person speaks 200 words per minute. And he said as follows, every word of Torah the Vilna Gaon says is a separate mitzvah. Imagine how many mitzvot you can get for learning Torah for one hour. If every minute is 200 mitzvot, so times it by 60, how much we get to? 60. So it's a 200 times 60, 2 times 6 is 12? 3 zeros. 12,000 12, mitzvot. 12,000 mitzvot for one hour. And imagine a person, instead of spending that hour learning, spends it and wasting his time. Now is the time to gather. It's the seven years of plenty. What is a person doing with his seven years of plenty? And that's what Abutai told you a Jew is supposed to be. As the Gemara asks, who's the smart person? A person who sees the future. A person who pays attention. You know, it sometimes bothers me. You know, you go to a Sheva Brachot, you go to a Brit, you go to a, a uh, Bar Mitzvah, and they tell the uncle, say a few words. And the uncle says, oh, I didn't prepare. You didn't prepare, you're the uncle. Why wouldn't you be saying a few words? I mean, like, like where's your head at? You have to think. I'm the uncle, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the cousin, I'm the this, I'm, they're, they're going to give me to speak. Okay, and if you and if you pray and they didn't give you to speak, okay, so you have a backup speech for next time. It's not the worst thing in the world. But people, they're not paying attention. They're there for right now, this moment. Oh, I, I didn't prepare anything, oh, but I'm going to... Person's supposed to think ahead of time. Think ahead of time and prepare. Rapam says, that is another reason why we learn Parshat Miketz on Hanukkah. You know, that, that's something to it? <laughs> Uh, and Parshat, uh, Parshat Miketz on Hanukkah. He says, why? One of the things Eretz Yisrael was known for, one of the things Eretz Yisrael was known for, was for its olive oil. Eretz Yisrael, one of the Shivat Minim, is the olive. Olive oil was plenty in Eretz Yisrael. People never paid attention to how much olive oil, pure olive oil, no pure olive oil. And all of a sudden, the Hanukkah, the one jug that they never paid attention to, became the most important aspect of the miracle, right? Sometimes we don't pay attention to how much we have. And Yosef HaTzadik was telling this to Paro, we gotta pay attention to right now what we have and take care of what we have in order to have later on. This is a very, very important lesson to take for us in life and everything we do. We must prepare. We must prepare right now for after. He says over here, Rabbi Huda Zasegel would tell Yeshiva Bachum and Yeshiva, you're going to get married, right? And they tell you, you're going to build a bayit ne'aman bi Israel. You're going to build a, a, a faithful house in Israel. What does it mean, faithful house? What does it mean? It's going to be a house that runs according to halacha. Do you know the halachot of basar v'chalav? You're all going to have a kitchen. You're all going to have milk and meat in your kitchen. Do you know the halachot of basar v'chalav? Do you know the halachot of ta'aruvot? Do you know the halachot that you have to have in order to run a kosher kitchen? They don't know. This, uh, they're building a bite in their mind. They did prepare. The Lubavitch Rebbe also was very big on this. Why he wanted all his all the Lubavitch uh, to in the yeshiva to get smichal in order that when they have a home, they'd be able to answer questions in Boston Rechalim. They'd be able to answer their wife, what's mutter and what's not. The wife is turning to the husband. What should I do? Something happened. Oh, I don't know. I mean, you don't know. You have to prepare. You're building a bite in their Israel. The kids are going to come home and ask you questions. This happened, that happened. Put, in the group, group Put in the group chat. Put on the group chat. <laughs> WhatsApp. Yeah. Check it up online. Rabbi right Google. Uh, uh, the person has to prepare for the future. That means learning, preparing, looking forward, and taking advantage of the time right now to do what's important. That is our second lesson from this week's parasha. We're going to move on to our third and final offering for this week's parasha. And it comes with a very... Frightening story. A very, um, uh, you'll hear it and you'll take it. In this week's parasha, we have the brothers being modeh. They're admitting that they made a mistake. 
after Yosef and Tzadik imprisons them all. And then Yosef and Tzadik comes out and says, okay, I'll let everyone leave except Shimon. Right? They leave, and then the brothers say, Aval Hashemim Anachnu. We are guilty. Alachenu. On our brother. Asherinu Tzarat Nafsho. We saw his pain. And we didn't do anything about it. First of all, to admit that a person was wrong is probably the biggest thing a person can ever do. You know, we say in the Selichot, a person who's modet to his Averot, Hashem gives him mercy. You know, the Midrash tells us that Adam HaRishon, when he made the sin, this, this, this year, Yom Kippur night in Ornatan upstairs, after the prayers, I sat for another hour with the, with the guys and we went through a shir about admitting to person's sin. And in there, we were talking about the shir of Galinsky brings down from Midrash Rabbah that says that Adam had shown, you know what his sin was? His sin was not eating the Eitz Hadat. That was okay. That uh, mistake could happen, whatever. You see, you know what Adam Arishon's sin was? Point not just pointing to her. Yeah. The sin was he never said, I made a mistake. He felt he made a mistake. He did Teshuvah. It says he did Teshuvah. But he never said, it's the Midrash, it's not me. He never said, I made a mistake by eating the Eitz Hadat. He wasn't modet to his sin. He did Teshuvah for doing wrong. But saying those words, he didn't do in someone saying, Allah Shamim Anahnu, we made a sin, that itself is the, one of the biggest things a person can ever do, is to be modet on his mistake. It's not an easy task to do for someone to say, I made a mistake. And in this week's parasha, it says, brothers, after 22 years, they never thought they made a mistake, but finally said they made a mistake. Here in the Pininim, Allah Torah, he says, you should know that when a mistake happens, it's important that you don't blame anyone else for your mistake. Sometimes a person will have a mistake, like Adam Rishon, he says, hey, this one, this one, this one, this one. Why he says, why does Pinot says you can't blame anyone else for your mistake? He says it based on the Gemara, the Sechem Ma'akot. The Gemara, the Sechem Ma'akot says, But there is Adam Rotzer Lelech, Molochin Oto. And the derech that a person wants to go, and the path that a person wants to go, that's the path he ends up on. Meaning you really want to end up on that path. And that's why you went there. And so the only person you have to blame is yourself. Harav Yitzhak Zilberstein Shlita shares a frightening story that was publicized in the media. It's a frightening story because it can happen to anyone. There was a businessman, we'll call him Jack. And he was a very... He was the, if you looked up businessman in the dictionary, it would be his picture. He took it very serious and it was his biggest priority. He had a, if he had a meeting, it was the most important thing in the world. Nothing can stop him. He expected people to show up on time in the meeting and he made sure that he always showed up on time to the meeting as well. He once had representatives from a large overseas corporation that wanted to meet with him so he can become the representative in his country for this corporation. It would have been something that would have taken him on a whole different path financially. He would have made a lot of money off this. And so he set up an appointment for nine o'clock in the morning. Not wanting to take his chances, he left at seven in the morning, believing he would beat the traffic and get there on time. And he planned to stop near the play of the meeting and he was going to pick up a cup of coffee. But unfortunately that day, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. He took the car from the driveway. They had no gas until he realized it. He had to go fill up the gas. He got stuck in a traffic jam. He was being detoured after detour after detour. It was already almost 8.30 and he was still far away from his, his destination. All of a sudden he remembered that there used to be a shortcut around here. And he said quickly, it's like, it's no one, it's a off the beat, off the beaten path road. It was like something that people who lived there knew about it. And so he decided to go down that road. He started going, going, going. He's catching up time. He was finally making it. He thought he might be able to save it and get to the meeting at time. And as soon as he's going back on the open road, a bunch of people come over to his car and try to stop him. He opens the window and says, well, what is it? They say, please, we have a boy that is a victim of a hit and run driver. 
The ambulance said they're 30 minutes away. Can you please take this boy to the hospital? He's unconscious. He's hurt bad. Please. He says, listen, I'm on a business trip. I can't. I can't. I'm sure there's other people on the road that are going to come. Any minute, another driver will pull up. They said, please, no one else comes there. Please take him. He says, I'm so sorry, but I have my meeting. I have to be there. I'm sorry, I can't take this boy. And he leaves. Jack left and he made his appointment. It was 8.55. He was walking into the building. He was about to walk into the elevator and his wife is calling him on the cell phone. She, he picks up the cell phone. His wife is calling. She knows never to bother him during business hours. His wife, he picks up his wife and his wife says, Jack, Jack, something terrible happened. You have to come out of your business meeting right now. He says, what, what happened? He, she says, our son, our son was riding on his bike to school and he was hit by a hit and run driver. He was hurt very badly at the scene. And by the time the ambulance came, he was pronounced dead. We want to know the worst part of it all. A businessman was stopped and they pleaded with him to transport our son to the hospital. And this cruel businessman said he was late for an appointment. He could have saved our child, but his appointment was more important than our child. As soon as Jack heard that, he fainted right there on the spot. The Pini Malatari tells us, we make the bed in which we sleep. We make choices and we decide our, on our priorities, but at whose expense and at what price. It's very important to look what path are we really going down. But on the same topic, Rav Schwab says, why is it all of a sudden now that the brothers are saying, Aval ashemim anachnu ala After 22 years, all of a sudden now at this point, they're saying, we sinned against our brother. What caused them to say this? Rav Schwab tells us a very important principle. Yosef had told his brothers, Meraglim atem. All of you are meraglim. All of you are spies. He says, one brother should go up, bring down Binyamin, and let all of you free. That was Yosef's original plan. Then, after the brothers remained in prison for three days, Yosef comes back to the brothers. And this is what he says to him. This is Yosef being the Tzafnat Paneach, the viceroy of Mitzrayim. They don't know he's Jewish. They don't know it's his brother. And Yosef tells them, Et ha'elokim ani yare. I fear Hashem. So instead of all of you staying here so your families don't see you, I'll send all of you back except for one. Yosef comes and tells the brothers, I rethought my decision. The brothers hear this. And the Pasuk then says, listen to what the Pasuk says. Pasuk says, and the brothers did this. What did they do? They didn't do anything. They just walked out of prison. Rav Shwa says, you know what it means? They did the same thing that Yosef did. They said, I fear Hashem. We're now going to go back 22 years to what we did. And we're reanalyzing it. Because all those years, they were down their opinion and this is the right thing. But now Yosef says, they came after three days and said, I thought about my decision. I'm changing my mind. What I did was wrong. I'm going to let all of you go except for one. I'm not going to keep all of you here. When they heard that, they said, a person who fears Hashem is someone who has to reconsider all the decisions that they made. And as such, now they were able to say, we actually made a mistake and sinned against our brother. Rav Schwab says that any Jew who truly fears Hashem one of his tasks every day is to reconsider all of his decisions. Did I do the right thing or not? Even what you did already. You know, you look a lot of times uh, in the post scheme and you'll see sometimes when they were younger, they, they, they gave up sack a certain way. And then later on in life, they changed it to another sack. Oh, what, are they playing around in games? No. The further they learned, the further they reconsidered what they, the sack that they gave, 
They may change their mind and say, no, I was learning wrong up until now, and now I'm learning it the right way. Right? Kishem, shekabalti schar al hadrisha, kena kabel schar al hadrisha. The same way someone is able to gain schar for expounding the Torah, but then he realized that his shot might be wrong, he gets schar also for taking it back. To reconsider a decision. Rashwab, they say about him as well, he was always examining his hashkafot, his beliefs. In 1990, in February 1990, he, the Rashwab delivered an address to his congregation. And he said, I have to tell you, when I was younger, I made a mistake. Rav Shamshim Rafal Hirsch was known, famously known for saying, Torah im derech based on the Perkei Avot, that, and this was known as Neo-Orthodoxy, which was able to take Torah in derech heretz. A person learns Torah and he has a job, an occupation, and the two and two should go work together. And this was always a big uh, point of controversy, was this done only Bishat al Chak, something that was done for a temporary merger during the reform, uh, the, the reform fight in, in, in Germany, or whether it's a way to live life. And Rav Schwab says that when he was younger, he said, Tarim Der Chertz was, was something for a temporary injunction, was something just for a temporary time. But he got older, he said, I re-examined Rav Sham Shafal Hirsch's philosophy, and now believe it's not just an emergency measure, but as applicable today as it was in the years before. He changed his Ashkafa based on re-examining what, what he, he looked at before. And so Rabbi a lot of times we make all sorts of decisions. Decision this way, decision that way, especially dealing with our children, our spouses, where we're going to live, how we're going to do. That is all fine and good to make decisions. But a God-fearing Jew doesn't just make decisions. He goes back to his decisions to review them, to see if they're accurate or not, if they're consistent or not if they're really what Hashem wants us to decide. And so Rabbi Tai, just to sum up the ideas that we learned from this week's parasha, we started off the idea that perception versus reality. You look at the news media and the news pundits and the anchormen, they say one thing, but we know it's lo v'chai v'lo v'koach ki'im beruchi, but rather with Hashem's spirit that everything happened. And therefore, the, the weak can destroy the mighty, and the few and, 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 and the few can win over the many. We also talked about Yosef and Sadiq and how he gave his advice to Paro when Paro never asked for his advice. Because he realized that when you have seven years of plenty, you can't let it go to waste. You have to take full advantage. And we explained how that applies to our lives, that when we're young and we have health and we're able to do a lot of things, we don't want to just waste it. You have to be like Yosef Sadiq, you have to select it, collect it all in order to be able to use it for the next world. And we also brought the last topic of how a person is led on the path that he wants to go. He has no one else to blame for his mistakes other than himself and how a true God-fearing person reviews all his decisions. I will tie with this. I want to wish everybody Shabbat Shalom, Hanukkah Sameach, as well as a Chodesh Tov, Le'Kulam.